Hello, everyone. Hey, right, I think I got my audio okay here. Happy Wednesday. Get my uh, intro script ready so I don't miss anything important. Hello, so I'm Jules Altus. I'm a real life CFI, and the point of these uh, lessons, the series that we're going through, is to talk through all of the topics that would be covered uh, on your way to getting your private pilot's license. So starting from assuming no knowledge of flying all the way through actually having your license and going out on your own with uh, passengers. Although this is intended to cover each of those different topics, um, it isn't a substitute for actually working one-on-one -on -one with your own flight instructor. So the best way and really the only way to learn to fly is with uh, an instructor in a one-on-one -on -one setting. Uh, that instructor will be able to actually identify areas where you're doing really well already or areas where you're struggling more and then work with you to make sure that you're developing those skills to be a safe and proficient pilot. Um, that all said though, I hope you find these lessons beneficial either for your sim flying or for your real world flying if you're already a pilot. Um, I've structured the lessons, uh, they follow the lesson plan that I would use with a real student, but I also am being attentive to folks tuning in for just a uh, periodic lesson here or there. Um, so if you're just dropping in, you know, once a week or something like that, that's still great. Uh, and I hope you can pick up some, some useful things. The older videos, if you want to watch some previous lessons, there's a couple of them still on Twitch, but a lot of them are now on YouTube. So that's the best place to go and, and find older videos. I'll post both the YouTube link in the chat and the Discord link. So if you have any questions that come up when you're watching the video after the fact, uh, the Discord is the best place to go and ask those. Uh, there's an area for feedback, an area for questions. Um, if you have any questions during the live stream, feel free to post in the Twitch chat and I will answer um, as soon as I see it. I also updated the add-ons today. So this is a command that um, is available anytime you want to use exclamation point add-ons. You can see which add-ons I'm, add I'm using. At the very top, I added this GNS package from working title. This replaces the GPS unit that we're using in this aircraft um, with a better version, a more realistic version of the software. Um, if you've been to some of the past flights, you might have noticed me getting frustrated periodically with the fact that it doesn't really work how it would actually work in the real world. Um, and so this makes it significantly better. Um, highly recommend that one, especially if you're going to be practicing to fly in this type of aircraft, then you'll have some familiarity with the interface. Um, last thing I'll mention is tomorrow, Thursday, I have a interview for a uh, flying club. So uh, excuse me, a flight school. And so I will be uh, not doing a flight tomorrow. So that's already updated on Twitch uh, and on the Microsoft Flights uh, forums. Um, so hopefully that's uh, pretty clear, but if, if you're trying to tune in tomorrow, I won't be here tomorrow. Uh, but we'll pick back up on Friday, assuming nothing else comes up. I think that's it. A couple of bits of follow-up from last flight. So let me flip over to iPad my notebook here. So we're gonna talk about emergency landing today. We'll talk about this whole agenda in just a second. One of the topics that came up yesterday was when you're using the glide slope indicator at an airport to make sure that you're flying in at the correct angle. Uh, Avasi has this far bar near bar approach where if you're too low, you'll see two red. If you're on the glide path, you'll see a white uh, in front and then reds in, in the rear. And then if you're above, you'll see two sets of white. I said that there was a memory device for that that I wasn't a particularly big fan of, but I know that some people really appreciate it. Uh, and so if this is useful to you to remember what they mean, the memory uh, memory device here is white on white, check your height, means you're too high. White on red, you're all right, essentially saying you're doing it correct. And then red on red, you're dead. So if you have red on red, that means you're too low, you need to get, you need to start uh, either level off until you reacquire glide slope, or if it's uh, really bad, you may just want to go around. Okay, so that's white on white, check your height. Red on white, you're all right. Red on red, you're dead. Another one that came up yesterday, we talked about um, in the NOTAMs for Palo Alto, there were two NOTAMs. We did a full standard briefing um, using 
one eight hundred WX brief. Um, and uh, I had mentioned that I usually use Foreflight and find it a little more streamlined. It's easier to digest what's going on. Um, I went back after the lesson and tried to like get my head around the way that one eight hundred WX brief is structured. Um, and I actually like it just fine. The new format isn't the format I learned when I was studying. Uh, but I think the new format's pretty good, so apologies for a bit of clunkiness there. Uh, but there were two notams that came up that I want to talk about. This first one is in the Palo Alto. Let me go full screen here so you can see a little better. Uh, bam. Hey, look at that. Okay, so the first one here is this uh, Palo Alto apron TXL uh, Juliet work in progress maintenance adjacent. So, I, so we saw a TXL in there, and I was expecting it to say TWI, taxiway. Um, and I hadn't seen TXL before, and I wasn't quite sure what that was supposed to mean. So I did some digging. Uh, it's in some ways very interesting, in some ways not interesting at all, but TXL means taxi lane. So one thing that we've talked about with Palo Alto is that... Uh, let me start at a different point, which is, so we have taxiways and taxi lanes. Taxiways are on the um, movement area of the airport. This is the area that ATC controls on the ground. And uh, taxiways get you from one point on the airport to another point on the airport. So you can imagine if you're in Palo Alto, for instance, I'll go back to, um, actually, we'll go to the flight sim here. I'll use this in about two seconds. So if you're in Palo Alto and say that you are going to taxi, uh, actually, let's go to a different airport. did my uh, social flight last night. We used Bush Talk Radio for that. A great tool if you want to do just kind of exploring. So like, let's say that you're coming to SFO and maybe you're here. Oops, come in. Uh, maybe you're here and you want a taxi to over here. So this would be a series of taxi ways that you're taking. These are all um, controlled by ATC movement areas. Um, for the most part, the vast majority of the uh, times that we're taxiing around the airport, this is the sort of thing that we're operating on is the taxiways. But there is a taxi lane, which would be, for instance, this sort of part of things. Um, I should double check that's actually true at uh, SFO. Uh, so grain of salt on this, this may be considered part of their movement area. Uh, I'm not sure for, for this specific airport. Um, but, uh, but the idea is that it takes you from a taxiway to where the aircraft is parked. So let's go back to Palo Alto where we're actually flying out of. Um, actually, let's look at San Carlos because it's a little bit cleaner. Palo Alto is weird and that's what I was sort of starting to hint at. So all of these things in here, these are all taxi ways. They're ways that you move around the airport controlled by ATC. But the aircraft are actually parked here when you start. And so to get to the taxi way, you move out on a taxi lane. Okay, so. Most of these airports, um, the way that the, the parking is set up, you would uh, taxi off the runway, follow whatever ATC's instructions are, and then you and then they'd say taxi to parking for the last bit, and you just go to where the plane is parked. Palo Alto is a little weird in that the movement area for Palo Alto actually starts um, here. So we'll, we'll look in the sim in about two seconds and we can see, we know the, the airport marking that indicates the movement area. What that means in practice is that ATC technically at Palo Alto only controls ground movement in this part, the part that I just wrapped around, um, which is really not that much of the airport. And so there's all of this down in the bottom section, which is uh, technically the non-movement area, which is than all taxi lanes. So because we are moving from the taxi ways into where the aircraft are parked, these are all taxi lanes, not taxi ways. In practice, doesn't make that much of a difference, uh, to us at least, because Palo Alto will give us instructions for the taxi lanes and we typically follow them just like if they were taxi ways. But technically we don't have to and technically we don't need their permission to move around out here. Um, they would probably call us up and, and say, what are you doing? Uh, but Technically, we don't need to, to ask permission to do it because they don't control this area. Okay, so all of that is a long-winded way to explain why that NOTAM that we were looking at says, oops, 
Come on. It says taxi lane. So I'll go back to the full screen here. So the reason it says taxi lane Juliet is that this here is a taxi lane, not a taxi way. So, okay. So, and then the rest of the NOTAM is pretty straightforward, um, which I will pull up real quick again. I'm essentially saying that there is a uh, work in progress for maintenance adjacent to taxiway Juliet. So they would likely not send us along that taxiway uh, or taxi lane, excuse me. So um, there are some other implications for like the required width of a taxiway versus a taxi lane on the airport and uh, for like wing to wing distances um, and spacing and things like that. So uh, not to gloss over the fact there are differences between taxi lane and taxiway. Um, but that's um, that's sort of the key bit. If you want to read more about this, there's um, Advisory Circular 150-5300-13B uh, that has a ton of information about uh, airport construction and taxiways, taxi lanes, and that sort of thing. Um, let's quickly look at the indications that tell us that this is a non-movement zone. So if we go to the flight sim... Here. Actually, I will do with the iPad so we can see where on the airport we are. So we're here currently, and if I take the airplane, and I'll just slew around to save us some time here. I'll actually mention while I'm moving this that I'm going to focus, well, I'll talk about that when we get up. So if we go look over here, we can see this uh, dashed on one side and then solid on the other side is the boundary for the movement area. So as soon as we cross that line, we are now in the movement area where ATC controls movement. On the other side of it, we are no longer in that movement area. So Palo Alto ground would give us uh, advisory on where to taxi so that we avoid other airplanes, but technically they aren't controlling our movement because we're off the movement area. So, okay, so that's what that line looks like. If you keep an eye out at other airports, you'll see that it's usually further back, but just the way Palo Alto is structured with the large parking lot kind of all to one side, it, it just doesn't work out quite that way. Okay, so let's flip back to our lesson plan for today. Um, the last follow-up from yesterday, there was this acronym in one of the NOTAMs. Uh, it said, uh, actually, I'll just pull it up. So here we are back in the NOTAMs. Um, and it said, it's in our airspace NOTAMs, which there tends to be quite a few of. I know I had found it in this area earlier, but perhaps it's easier to find again back on the um, WX weather brief. So I will scroll up through to the top and then flip over to the weather brief. Oh, I do have another way to do this. Um, the other thing to know is that they are ordered by the date that they became effective. Um, and so if you know that rough date, then you can find, find it earlier, which I should have thought of immediately because I knew the date was in May. So um, what it says here is, let me switch to the full screen. This uh, ZOA Communications DOM uh, CPDLC available on KUSA. Uh, effective May to permanent. And I looked at CPDLC and sort of went, oh, I've never seen that acronym before. At least I don't remember what it was if I've looked it up in the past. Um, 
And so this is a um, controller pilot data link communications. Um, and I will put a, a link to the Wikipedia page for that if you are interested to learn more. Um, it's a pretty cool idea. Essentially what it is is that the one of the problems that they're starting to have as more aircraft are flying is that the um, for aircraft flying across the whole United States. So it really doesn't apply to us because we don't have the technology to use this anyway. Um, but if you were flying a bigger aircraft, maybe a commercial operation, this is a way that instead of ATC communicating with you over the radio and giving you information about, for instance, which waypoints you're supposed to go to or or other instructions like that, they can instead send it to you via this uh, CPDLC and it will show up electronically in your aircraft um, in a, an easier to use format, but also one where you could potentially enter it directly into your uh, flight management system for the aircraft um, without having the back and forth that you would need on the radio. Uh, my understanding is you're also supposed to hear the uh, voice communication over the radio for it, but it does make the communication uh, cleaner. And so this is a way of avoiding needing to, normally if there's a lot of aircraft in one sector, they'll divide that sector up and have multiple people staff different parts. But then every time you cross between people, there needs to be a handoff. And so now you've introduced this overhead from the handoff. And so instead they're trying to make the technology um, more streamlined so that you don't have as many handoffs. A single person can manage more of the traffic without that voice over the radio communications. Um, anyway, a great link there if you want to read more. Um, and a really good example of one where, you know, we were doing our pre-flight. Um, there was a NOTAM that before we go and fly, we'd want to make sure we understand how that impacts our flight. Um, and then once we understood what the impact was, then we can say, okay, well, that doesn't apply to us. Um, and this is a permanent NOTAM. And so uh, next time going through the... Um, Pre-flights, then we'll see it and say, okay, well, we already know what this is. We already know that it's not something that's relevant to us. Okay, cool. So that's all the follow-up I had from last uh, lesson. If you have any questions, always feel free to post in the chat here. Um, otherwise, I am going to grab my water bottle actually super quick because I forgot to, and I will be back in like 10 seconds. Sorry about that. <laughs> My dog is very confused. <laughs> He's like, normally you sit here for two hours in the morning, Dad. What are you doing? Okay, so emergency landings are our topic for today. The objective is to develop knowledge and skills associated with emergency landings, cho including choosing an emergency landing location and considerations for a survivable landing. Couple references, the AFH chapter 18 is all about emergency procedures. Tomorrow's lesson will be about other emergency operations. Um, so this chapter in general is a really good read. The aircraft uh, flying uh, flight manual and the POH pilots operating handbook are both good resources. This is where you'll find the actual emergency procedures for the specific plane you're flying. And then of course, this is something that is part of the airman certification standards. We got a pup in the window, and usually a pup in the window means a pup who's about to bark. So, forewarning there. Okay, builds on the lessons we talked about, normal and crosswind approaches and landings, and then forward slips to a landing. Part of the reason that we did both of these two first is that it's the exact same kinds of skills that we're going to use for an emergency landing. And we'll talk about how that is. A little bit of schedule, um, one hour ground, one hour flight, and then we'll practice this on multiple flights. I think this is about what it'll be today. Um, I was reflecting on the elements of the lessons that we do in these live streams. A lot of the lessons that we would be doing in the real world at this point in training would be three hour segments of time. Um, so we would probably spend like, you know, depending on the lesson, uh, 30 minutes to an hour and a half on the ground, and then another hour and a half out flying. 
Um, because I'm trying to keep these to two hours, that means I'm cutting back certain things. And I think what I'm going to prioritize cutting back on is the pre-flight on the ground, the taxiing, the takeoff, all that sort of things. Um, I struggle with this a little bit because in real flight instruction, practicing those skills over and over again is a critical thing. So, you know, we maybe we'd be going out to practice emergency landings today, but in getting out to the practice area, we're also practicing taxiing, uh, aileron deflections for the wind. We're ta practicing our run-ups, our takeoffs, um, and all that sort of stuff. So um, consciously making the choice to remove that from the lesson to save time. Um, but keep in mind that those are things that are a critical part of practicing and developing those skills. Uh, but since I'm here, there we go, there's the pup. One second. He is terrified of scooters and skateboards. Um, those are his arch nemeses. So if he gets an open window that he can stick his head out of and a scooter, a scooter goes by, then, uh, then that's it. Then, then he's, uh, then he's on guard. But, uh, anyway. Okay. So like I said, I'm going to pull out the, um, elements of the lesson that are about, uh, that, that with a student would be where the student is practicing all of these fundamental skills that we've talked about before. How do you take off? How do you do your straight and level, your climbs, descents, turns, all those sorts of things. Um, if it comes up during the actual course of the lesson, of course, I'll call things out. Um, but really I'll try and focus on the key elements specific to this lesson that we're talking about today. All right. Speaking of lesson for today, couple lesson elements. Um, it seems like a lot. It's mostly just spread out more. Normally I try and group into more subgroups. We'll talk a little bit about the PIC responsibility and authority and what that means. This is a really important, uh, FAR types of emergency landings. There's three different types. We've talked a couple of times already about aviate, navigate, and communicate. So we'll uh, talk a bit more about that today. A, B, C, D, E. This is the actual uh, steps that you go through in flying the emergency landing. Uh, we'll talk about how to actually land the plane in an emergency. So this is everything today is about losing an engine and landing the plane without an engine. So uh, tomorrow we'll talk about other kinds of emergencies that can occur. What if you lose your electrical system, that sort of thing. Um, but today is all about if you lose an engine, what do you do and where do you go? Talk about actually flying that approach. How do you safely land the aircraft? A couple considerations for making a safe landing. I will talk a little bit about terrain selection, considerations for ditching. So ditching is if you're going to land the aircraft in the ocean or a lake or another body of water. Uh, we'll talk about some psychological hazards, just some things to be aware of. Um, and in practice, we'll be working to mitigate some of these. So good to be aware of, but then that's also why we practice. We'll talk a bit about what we're going to actually do today. There's kind of two key elements and then common errors. So, okay, hopefully it doesn't seem too overwhelming. I promise it all flows through pretty nicely um, and we'll go one step at a time. So the first thing to talk about here is this 91.3 PIC responsibility and authority. And so I'll pull up the full regulation, but what I really want to highlight for this lesson is in an in-flight emergency requiring immediate action, the pilot in command may deviate from any rule of this part to the extent required to meet that emergency. So we talked about, um, over the last several lessons, we've talked about different federal aviation regulations. You may remember things like the weather minimums that are required. Um, uh, there are other regulations about um, all different aspects of uh, flying things like you know minimum altitudes, um, cruising altitudes, things like that. Um, there's also regulations about, for instance, we talked about you can't enter the Bravo airspace unless you're cleared into the Bravo, right? And so you need to hear cleared into the Bravo before you can enter. What this FAR 91.3, and this is the, the second clause of there, we'll look at the full thing in just a second. Um, but what this one is saying is that you as pilot in command can deviate from any other rule in uh, the federal re regulations if it's something that you need to do to rise to meet an emergency. So your primary goal in an emergency is getting the aircraft and passengers safely on the ground um, with minimum damage to people on the ground. So 
The aircraft is not the concern. It's about rising to meet the emergency and then making a safe landing from there. So if you, for instance, need to land in the class Bravo because the best field is in the class Bravo, uh, and that's the safest way to rise to meet the emergency, that is an acceptable thing to do. Uh, after the fact, you may get a question about it. So uh, they may say, hey, how did you decide to do that? Um, but in general, as pilot in command, uh, you're given a lot of uh, latitude on that decision-making process. Uh, okay, so let's look at the full 91.3. You'll notice that this is 0.3, right? So this is uh, one of the first actual regulations as part of this part. So if we go 91.3, the first section here says the pilot in command of an aircraft is directly responsible for and is the final authority to the operation of that aircraft. So as flight instructors, one of our primary goals uh, among making sure that you're a safe and proficient pilot, but really what that means from like a federal aviation regulation standpoint is making sure that you're ready to be pilot in command. So when you and I first go out flying, at that point in your training, your flight instructor is the pilot in command. So they're teaching you, you're picking up these skills, but at the end of the day, they're directly responsible for and the final authority to the operation of that aircraft. As you start to develop your skills, and especially as you then finally solo, you're taking on more and more of that pilot and command responsibility. And privileges to solo, the endorsement that your instructor will give you is them endorsing you saying that, I feel that this student is um, prepared to be pilot and command of this aircraft. Um, and they can be the final authority to operating that aircraft. Once you get your full private pilot's license, that's the FAA saying the same sort of thing, saying that you are qualified to be pilot in command of this aircraft. Not only that, but you can also take out passengers in that aircraft. You can go flying to other parts of the country in that aircraft. Um, so it's sort of the, the meaty weight of what we're doing with the training is this, preparing you to be pilot in command. The second clause then on this is the in-flight emergency one we just read. You may deviate from any rule of this part to the extent required to meet that emergency. So when we talk about emergency operations, that's something to keep in the back of your mind is like, even if you know that there are rules um, that you're violating to make your way safely through an emergency, you are allowed to do that by the FARs. There's this specific clause for that reason. Uh, the last piece on here is basically saying that uh, if you get a request to the administrator to send a report, then you'll send a report of the deviation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but if you talk to people who have had emergencies, um, for depending on the emergency and what actually happened. So like if you had an emergency and, and broke into the class Bravo, you might actually get a request for a written thing, or you may want to submit uh, something beforehand we can talk about too. Um, but if it's like, uh, you know, something, something happens, you declare an emergency, you get back safe and there wasn't much more to it. Often you don't get any kind of follow-up questions. So, um, people sometimes get nervous about declaring an emergency because it's like, oh, but the paperwork and... The reality is for, you know, depending on the emergency, of course, but, um, but often this, the stories end with, you know, not much additional paperwork if there wasn't much that occurred. Um, okay, so that's 91.3. Again, the key part for us here is that we may deviate from any rule to extent required to meet that emergency. Let's talk about the different types of emergency landings we're going to uh, discuss today. So one is a forced landing. Forced landing means that you do not have an engine, and so you are gliding the aircraft down to a safe landing. Forced because you don't have a choice. You're landing the aircraft whether you want to or not. A precautionary landing would be if you have engine power still, but maybe something is going on where you're either worried you're going to lose your engine or there's indications that something's uh, working incorrectly, but you still want to get the aircraft on the ground. A precautionary landing is nice because if you have the engine power available, it gives you more options. It allows you to better control where you're going. Maybe you can actually fly to a local airport instead of needing to land in the immediate vicinity. Um, but uh, the procedures for that are in some ways similar uh, in that you, uh, well, well, we'll talk about what the procedures are. Um, but uh, the difference here, again, forced landing, you do not have an engine, and so you're landing, you gotta land right now. Precautionary landing, you have at least some engine power and you can maybe um, either fly further or have a little more options. 
The last one is ditching. So ditching would be if you're uh, ditching the aircraft in uh, over a body of water. Um, and that we'll talk about what that looks like, but essentially it's flying just like we do to a runway, flying over the water um, and then landing in the water. The aircraft will float for a, a couple of minutes on the water uh, if you do the landing correctly. And so uh, then getting out of the aircraft and, and getting away from the aircraft. All right, so there's our types of landings for today. We've talked a couple of times about this aviate, navigate, communicate idea. And so if it feels like you've heard this 10 times already, uh, that may be the case. It's a really important philosophy for flying. And what it means is that your primary goal is to aviate, your secondary goal is to navigate, and then your uh, last goal here is to communicate. And why that's important, especially in an emergency, is the most important thing for a uh, what the FAA calls a controlled crash, right? Essentially that you're coming in to land and you're doing everything you can to have a, a safe and non-eventful landing um, is flying the aircraft. So your number one priority is aviating first. You want to make sure you're maintaining the correct airspeed. You want to make sure you're following the correct procedures for a safe landing. You want to make sure you're doing all of these things. If you get distracted from aviating, maybe you're focusing on navigating or worse, if you're focusing on communicating um, and you forget to aviate, that's where you could end up in maybe a spin or a stall at a bad position, or you could end up losing a lot of um, altitude for no good reason, just getting distracted. Um, so your number one priority is to aviate. When we talk about communicating with ATC on the radio, um, You'll, know, you'll notice that that's the last priority on here. So if ATC is asking you a bunch of questions, you can just ignore them. I've had several instructors whose advice is just turn off the radio. Like after you make your Mayday call, we'll talk about how to do that, but after you make the Mayday call, just turn off the radio because like, you don't want the distraction anyway and they can't really help you land the airplane, right? So at the time of the emergency, the best thing to do is to focus on flying the airplane. A, B, C, okay, so A, B, C, D, E. This is my favorite uh, acronym for, oops, I haven't created the file yet, but we'll talk about what these all are. So this is my favorite um, acronym for uh, flying, or I'm sorry, for flying for um, emergencies. There's a couple of other ones you may hear if you go looking around, but I think this one is a, a pretty well-liked standard. And essentially it means airspeed, best place to land, checklist, declare, and then execute the emergency landing. So if you lose your engine, jump into the ABCs, right? And we want this to be automatic. So if the engine quits for any reason in the sky, immediately you're starting airspeed, best place to land, checklist, um, one, two, three. And it should be an automatic response. You shouldn't have to think about it. It's just, okay, the engine quit. I'm gonna jump into ABC. Uh, C takes a moment and then you can get to D and E if. Uh, well, we'll talk about what those two mean. Um, this first one, airspeed, and the second one, best place to land, are essentially done at the same time. Um, so this is a reminder, A and B and the ABCs are a reminder to do both of them, but essentially you're going to immediately establish your best glide airspeed. We'll talk more about that in just a second. Um, and turn to the field where you're going to land. Because at the moment you lose your engine, you no longer have that forward power, it means that everything that you do from that point on is um, losing you altitude. And so you want to make sure that you're maximizing your glide range, which is what this speed is, um, but then also that you're getting to the best place to land and starting to line up for it. So if there's a good field that you had picked out, we'll talk about what that looks like in just a little bit. But if you have a good field, you want to turn to that right away, not waste altitude in like trying to debug what's going on or anything, just airspeed, best place to land. First things first. To elaborate a little bit on airspeed, we talked a bit about um, uh, various airspeeds, VX, VY, for our takeoff and climb out. One of the airspeeds that we haven't talked much about yet is this VG. This is the best glide speed. So in a Cessna 172, it's 68 knots. When you get in an aircraft, um, there's a handful of V speeds that you should have memorized. VR, the rotation speed, definitely. VY, the best climb outs, best rate of climb. VX, the best angle of climb. And then VG, the best glide speed. Um, 
when I go flying with a new pilot or go flying in a new airplane, I will usually ask this as just like sort of a background question. One, to make sure that I know what these numbers are for the aircraft we're flying, um, but also to kind of feel out to make sure that they know what those numbers are. Uh, if you get in a plane with a new instructor for the first time, they're probably going to ask you this right away, the, the VR, VG, VX, VY, uh, because you should have them all memorized. Um, there, really isn't, there really isn't an excuse for not having it memorized. So that's 68 in the Cessna 172 SP. Uh, each aircraft will have a different speed. You can find that usually in the POH, um, more or less always. So what is VG, the best glide speed? Essentially, it's the speed that allows you to travel the furthest distance along the ground for every um, unit of altitude lost. So it's the, it's the speed that'll allow you to glide the furthest um, as you're losing altitude. If you're gliding too fast, if you're going more than 68 knots in the Cessna 172, you're gonna land short of uh, that best glide point. And if you're going too slow, you're gonna land actually even shorter. And the reason for that is all about the drag versus speed we talked about before, right? So at faster speeds, we know we have this increase in parasitic drag or parasite drag, excuse me. At lower speeds, we have this increase in induced drag. And so the minimum drag speed here is a very specific airspeed. And that's what's gonna give us our best glide. So if we go too fast, we have too much extra drag in one direction. If we go too slow, too much extra drag in the other direction. And so we wanna hit a very precise speed. That speed does change with weight. So uh, in your POH, you'll have a little bit more information, but memorizing this uh, for where we are in training right now, memorize 68 knots, and that's what we can use for the glide. Uh, okay, so that's the best glide airspeed. Again, a super important number. Um, when we actually go up and fly this, first thing we'll do is pitch for uh, our best glide airspeed. Next place, or next thing we do is find the best place to land. Um, hopefully this is a pre-selected landing area. One of the ideas that I've heard uh, more recently that I really liked actually was, I'm gonna flip back over here. This idea of you wanna be like Tarzan swinging vine to vine when you're flying. And what that analogy means is that you're essentially looking out in the distance for what your best emergency landing field is ahead of you and then holding that emergency landing field in your mind, sort of like you're holding onto a vine. And then as that vine moves behind you, then you reach out and look for the next emergency landing field and grab it there. So as you're flying around, you always wanna have in your head what the emergency landing field you'd go to is. Um, it starts to become a little more automatic as you practice it, um, but especially early in training, you wanna be always thinking about, okay, if I lost my engine right now, where am I gonna land? Uh, and what would that look like? One mistake that people sometimes make with this is forgetting that the nice landing field they just flew over is behind them, um, meaning that you can turn back around to a field that's behind you. Um, as long as it's still in glide range, that's totally acceptable to do. Uh, so don't forget, just because a field has passed behind the plane doesn't mean that it's necessarily not an option anymore. Okay, so A, B, C, D, E, we have airspeed, best place to land, both happen immediately. Couple of notes on the best place to land. You wanna turn there immediately. So you wanna get headed to your best place to land. There's a chance that we can bring the engine back online. We'll talk about the procedure there in checklist, um, but you should immediately start flying as though you're not gonna have your engine and just be ready to fly the plane to a, to a safe landing. You want to land into the wind. So when we leave, we get the ATIS. The ATIS will tell us the wind direction. In our pre-flight, we've also looked up our winds aloft and we'll have a general sense of what the wind is on the ground. Um, we also can identify wind direction by looking at, for instance, flags on the ground or uh, ripples in the water on the ground. And we use those things to determine which direction we wanna land. We wanna land into the wind because landing into the wind reduces our ground speed. So if we're flying at 60 knots and we're coming into land and we land into the wind, maybe it's a 30 knot wind, let's say it's really strong winds. Uh, so we're coming in at 60 knots and we uh, or we'll, we'll say 68 knots, we use our best glide seat. So we're coming in at 68 knots. Um, yeah, that's fine. Um, we wouldn't, we don't use the glide speed all the way through the landing because we want to touch down at a slower than glide speed, but we'll talk about that in, in just a moment. Um, but at any rate, let's say that we're coming in at 68 knots and we have a 30 knot headwind. That means that our speed over the ground is 38 knots. And so if we were to touch down at that exact moment, we're going 38 knots 
of speed as we make contact with the ground. And so our deceleration is going to be uh, significantly less than if we were going, say, 60 knots. So every bit of um, speed we can reduce for our speed over the ground um, is, I guess, one fourth of the impact uh, of the, the controlled collision. On the flip side, if we were landing with the wind, so if we were flying with a tailwind, so let's say we're going 68 knots and we have a 30 knot tailwind, then when we touch down, we're going 98 knots, um, which is really, really fast. And so then when we make contact with the ground, that deceleration is going to be significantly stronger um, and significantly more uh, likely to, to end poorly. So we always want to land into the, into the wind um, to make sure that we're reducing our ground speed. If altitude allows, you can use the GPS nearest function to find the closest airport. It may be that there's actually a nice landing strip near you that you can just go to. Um, also in your pre-flight planning, you would have noticed, or you would have uh, noted what those alternates were along your path. So you should also have a pretty good idea of where those are, but the GPS nearest button is a, a nice option there. Uh, if you identify a better place to land, and also just to reiterate, this is if altitude allows. So going back to this aviate, navigate, communicate thing, the most important thing is to fly the plane. Um, but if you do have the time while you're coming down, you know, the glide actually can take a little bit of time. Um, and so you may be able to find a better landing spot as you go. Which leads into this next one. If you identify a better a place on the way, you can change your landing spot. So you should have a spot in mind that is your best option that you've seen so far. And you want to turn right to it right away so that you at least have something you're going to that would provide a suitable landing area. Um, but if on your way down you identify a better field or a, a different option you hadn't seen before, um, don't feel like you have to stay to that. It's whatever's going to be the safest for the landing. One rule of thumb to keep in mind, you can glide in the Cessna 172 SP about 1.5 nautical miles per thousand feet of altitude. So just to put that in context, when we were doing our uh, practice earlier, we were doing a lot of our uh, practicing around slack. And so Slack is, um, oh, there we go. Slack is right here. And so if I look from Slack to Palo Alto Airport, that's 6.5 miles. So if I'm at uh, 4,000 feet, I could glide six miles. If I'm at 4,500 feet here, then I could glide more or less all the way back to Palo Alto. So um, that's actually a pretty, like you can glide relatively far as long as you immediately are getting for your best glide speed and immediately turning to where you need to go. Um, we'll do a couple of practices and you with your instructor would do uh, a couple of practices where you just hold the best glide speed and see how that glide looks and see how far you're making for progress. Um, but that is also something to think about is when you're uh, practicing things, the more altitude you have, that's uh, money in the bank as far as what you can do for uh, emergency landing options. Okay. So good rule of thumb here, you can glide at 1.5 nautical miles per thousand feet altitude. Um, one other thing that's a useful tool if you are using ForeFlight, they have this thing called the Glide Advisor. Um, so you can see me toggling it on and off there. And I have it set up for a uh, comparable aircraft that's another Cessna 172 SP. Um, that gives that glide ratio from the POH. And so when I'm flying, it'll actually show, and today you'll see this kind of green outline that shows me where I could glide to. And uh, my understanding at least is that that also takes into account the uh, winds aloft. So that would include if you're flying into a headwind or a tailwind that you can go faster or further or shorter. It also includes kinetic energy the aircraft already has. So remember if you're flying at 120 knots cruise, that's, you know, 50 knots faster than your best glide speed. So in your initial, like if you lost your engine, you're flying 120 knots, you have 50 knots essentially of additional speed that you can convert into altitude if you want to, um, uh, or that you can use to just continue holding that altitude longer, which is what I would advise. Um, so again, if you're moving faster, you have more kinetic energy in the aircraft that also is money in the bank that you can uh, convert into altitude or to extend your glide range. Um, and for flight, uh, my understanding is that that takes all of that into account and gives you an estimate of your available glide range. Um, I use it as sort of a, a guideline. I wouldn't consider a field right on the edge to be a viable option just because I think 
that assumes that I'm able to execute this whole thing perfectly. But uh, having that guideline about how far the aircraft, at least by the POH, can glide is really useful. Um, speaking of the POH, one last thing we'll talk about with glide is if we load up the POH under, um, I believe it's under performance, they will have a section on uh, best glide. Let me see. It might be under, yeah, I think it's under emergencies. There we go. Okay, so it's emergency procedures. And so this is, the POH also describes what to do in an emergency, but here is where we get that um, speed of 68 knots. That's that glide speed. Uh, it assumes we have flaps up and zero wind, and then it tells us from whatever height we're starting at how far we could glide. So sure enough, we said it's about 1.5 per thousand feet. So if we go uh, uh, 2,000 feet, we could glide three miles. At 4,000 feet, we can glide six miles all the way up. So there's our rule of thumb in action, um, but that comes from the POH. Okay. We've talked about A and B airspeed and best place to land. Uh, let's talk about C, the checklist. So we're gonna practice a procedure today, um, which I'll, I'll demonstrate in the aircraft, but is a flow. And we've talked a little bit about flows, but flows are ways of using the aircraft's panel itself to remind yourself of the things that you need to check. So the flow that we're gonna to do today starts down at the bottom of the aircraft, um, where that uh, fuel selector valve is and the uh, tank selector, and then goes up to the mixture uh, and throttle knobs and then over to the left. So it kind of makes this L shape. Um, and we use that flow to then quickly go through and do everything we need for the emergency. So. Uh, fuel selector both fuel uh, I'm sorry uh, fuel tank both fuel selector in I'm sorry I said that wrong fuel selector both fuel cutoff on uh, mixture rich um, uh, I wish I had my panel in front of me I'll pull this up we can actually do it well we'll hop in the plane and do it in just a moment um, but you use the panel as a reference to make sure you're not missing anything um, when you do this flow and you want to do it immediately after you've got your airspeed in your best place to land, you want to do that flow and see if you can get the engine to restart. Maybe it's something silly. Maybe you have the fuel cutoff is pulled out, um, especially in Microsoft Flight Sim, it starts with the fuel cutoff pulled out. So that's like a, a likely one in the sim. Um, but in the airplane, it could be a couple of different things. And this flow lets you debug it quickly just to see if something simple res restarts the engine. If that doesn't work, then we're going to pull out our checklist. And this is an example of where having a paper checklist is really useful. So if you are flying an aircraft like this, you should have a paper checklist with you. So this is a, a scan of the paper checklist that I typically use. And you see on the back, it has this power loss in flight. And so what we would do is take our checklist out and run our finger down and just make sure that we've done everything on there. So if we have, if we have all of this um, completed, then uh, then that's good. Otherwise, if there's anything that we missed or anything that was more, uh, wasn't part of our immediate flow, like the really standard debugging, this would also catch those things. So to re reiterate, we do the flow from memory. This is all of our memory items um, that you want to have memorized. And then we can cross check with the POH. If that doesn't restart the aircraft at that point, then um, we accept that the emergency is happening and make sure that, well, we accept the emergency is happening from the beginning, but at that point, then we are landing the aircraft without an engine. And so a couple of things that we want to do. Um, one is we're going to declare the emergency and we do two things to do that. One is we squawk 7700. So we'll talk about the three emergency squawks tomorrow, but there's 7700, 7600, and 7500. Um, so in the aircraft, we've looked a couple of times already at the transponder. Um, I'll load up the aircraft here. So we've looked a couple of times at the transponder. Uh, typically, we have that set to 1200. That's the VFR squawk code. Um, for this, we would set it, though, to, in an emergency, we set it to 7700. So if I go, um, and we wouldn't do this in the real plane unless it actually was an emergency. Uh, but if I flip back over to here, so we have our 
Uh, transponder is here. We have it in altitude reporting mode. Let's just flip things on. Normally it's at 1200. If we go 7700, which I'm not going to do, um, then that would immediately notify ATC that there's an emergency. So a pop-up would show on their screen and it would flag this plane as having an emergency. Um, if we did 7600, uh, that means lost communications and 7500 means hijacking. So we'll talk more about those tomorrow, but these are specific squawk codes that we use to communicate that we're having an emergency. So part of our declare step, squawk 7700. Next thing we do is a mayday call. Uh, we can do this either with the approach or center or if we're on a tower frequency or there's a nearby tower. You can also use the guard frequency of 121.5. This is something that's monitored by aircraft and towers uh, wherever you go. And so this is a good, if you're not sure who to contact, 121.5 is a good one to use. Uh, but it's better to use a nearby tower or the center frequency you're already talking to. That mayday call sounds something like this. You would say mayday, 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 so three times. Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, um, total engine failure, emergency landing. You can give an uh, estimation of where you are. So maybe you say uh, three miles west of Palo Alto Airport at 3,500. Uh, you can give additional information. There's some things they'd like to know. For instance, how many people are on board, how much fuel do you have? Um, but like we said before, the most important thing is aviate, navigate, communicate last. So telling them, declaring you have an emergency, saying who you are and where you are, um, gives them at least enough to start with. They may respond and ask you questions, things like how much fuel do you have, how many people are on board, um, other things like that. But, you know, you don't have to respond and honestly, you probably shouldn't waste your time on it. One thing that you may want to consider though um, is saying the whole thing again. So you could say, Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lee and Tango India Syria, 3,500, four miles uh, west of Palo Alto, total engine failure, emergency landing. Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lee and Tango India Sierra, four miles west of Palo Alto Airport, 4,500, uh, total engine failure, emergency landing. Um, and then turn your radio off. That'd be a very reasonable thing to do. Um, and you'd be squawking 7700, so they would see you on their ATC display as like having this big, um, it shows up as like, I think an exclamation point and the airplane turns red or something. There's a whole bunch of stuff that happens. Um, so, okay. And then the last thing we do, the E on here is the execute the emergency landing. That's most of what we're gonna be doing in the sim today. We'll, we'll, we'll do A, B, C, D, E, but the skill that we're trying to develop here is really this. A, B, C, D, E, or I'm sorry, A, B, C, D are all things you should practice at home uh, in the comfort of your own, uh, uh, like on your couch or whatever, just to make sure that you have these down um, immediately and from memory. It shouldn't be something you have to think about while you're in the air. And so the skill that you go and practice your, with your flight instructor is really this part of it, the how do you do an emergency landing. Um, it's always painful when a student comes to a lesson and they don't have these down cleanly because it is one of the most important things that we as pilot and command need to be ready for is what do we do in the case of an emergency. Um, and an engine loss, if you immediately get your best airspeed, immediately find the best place to land, start through your checklist, declare it, and then execute that landing, you can have a safe landing that everyone walks away from. Um, but if you haven't practiced these, then you're like thinking through, okay, I know it's ABCs, A is airspeed, okay, I'm gonna do my airspeed, okay, B is uh, best place to land, okay, I'm trying my best place to land. Every second you're wasting on that is altitude lost um, and makes it harder to execute that, that safe landing. Uh, okay, so a reminder to practice all of these. Uh, executing the emergency landing. So first thing to do is a survival statement. I like to do this um, because it's just a reminder that at this point you're flying the aircraft to the ground. So something like, um, uh, I'm a glider pilot, I'm gonna land this airplane uh, safely. Because uh, that's essentially what you are when you've lost an engine in a, an aircraft like this, is you're just a glider pilot then, which is um, something people do all the time. The approach is to get to the key point at 1,000 feet AGL. You can use a spiral descent if you need to, if you're too high above that key point. Uh, and then you do a rectangular pattern uh, if altitude permits. So said again, we practice that traffic pattern at the airport in the same way every single time. So when we're flying our traffic pattern, we're a thousand feet when we're a beam, our landing point, we do that nice uh, downwind base and final leg. 
if we have an emergency landing that we need to do, our best case scenario, if we have the altitude and if, um, if we have the altitude to work with, is to fly that exact same pattern. So we've practiced this 100 times at the airport. We're going to fly it the exact same way we do at the airport in the pattern. I'm sorry, in the emergency. So in this case, we would have the wind is coming from this direction, more or less. We get to our key point, which is a beam, our touchdown point, 1,000 feet above the ground. So you can see this uh, key position here. Uh, and then we continue to glide in at best glide. As we start to do this um, landing, depending on how high we are above our touchdown point, we can add flaps to increase our drag, and that'll increase our rate of descent. Um, uh, we can also cut the corner here if we need to get there. If we're too far away, we can just sh shave off and head in earlier. Uh, we can also do our forward slip if we need to lose altitude additionally. Something to keep in mind for landing these without an engine, you can always lose altitude, but you can't get that altitude back. So it's better to come in high and have, uh, and then do maybe a, a forward slip to lose that altitude than it is to come in low um, because you can't stretch the glide. Um, so when we looked at VG, there's this diagram, there's that best glide speed gets you the best possible distance traveled over the ground. If you try to pull up on the yoke, like if you're just like, oh, I'll just make the airplane go a little bit farther, it's gonna cause you to get more induced drag, it's gonna cause you to drop down and you'll actually land short of your best glide. When we practice these at the airport, part of what we're practicing too is that making sure that the reaction is to hold best glide not try and pull up and stretch the glide. So if you try and pull up and stretch the glide, you'll land short. The first time you do it at the airport, you'll see, and it's, um, it's, I mean, it doesn't work. The physics don't work out. All right, I know it's a lot so far. If there's any questions, feel free to throw them out. Otherwise, we talked about A, B, C, D, E. Uh, we're gonna go and practice all of these, but let's talk a little bit about some notes details and other considerations for the actual flight. So this is a little bit more rapid fire, but a couple of things to keep in mind. A couple of effects from headwinds and tailwinds you should be aware of. So we talked already about the ground speed and the fact that if you land into a headwind, you have a much slower ground speed, which means less energy at touchdown, which means uh, easier to do a, a safe landing there. If you have a tailwind, it could be more uh, hazardous. You have a higher ground speed and more energy that you need to dissipate. The other effect of a headwind that's good to be aware of is in a strong headwind, your best glide speed may actually be faster. And what analogy I like for that um, to kind of give some context to it is, let's say that the headwind you're flying into is 68 knots. And so you're flying at your best glide speed of 68 knots but because it's a 68 knot headwind, your speed over the ground is zero. And so, yes, you're flying at the best glide speed, but in reality, you're just sitting in the exact same spot on the ground and eventually you're just gonna like come to the ground. And so you haven't made any forward progress. And so to make forward progress, you actually need to go faster than your best glide speed. Something to keep in mind um, for an emergency, again, the best initial thing to do is get to your best glide speed. And then as you get closer to your landing, you can assess those sorts of things. Um, but if you have a strong headwind, you do need to increase your airspeed uh, to account for that. Next thing to talk about is aircraft configuration. So if you use full flaps, you'll get a steeper uh, and you'll reduce the glide that you have. Half flaps, uh, you'll have a little longer glide. No flaps will be the longest glide. So if you're coming into land and you know you're going to make your field, that's where you can start bringing in your flaps uh, to make your descent steeper. Uh, but you want to leave your flaps off until you actually get... Uh, until you're sure you're going to make your field. One other quick note about the Cessna 172 in particular is that the flaps are electronically um, controlled, which means that you, uh, ele electrically controlled, which means that you need to have the battery on in order to operate the flaps. We'll talk more about this when we talk about losing a battery, losing your electrical system tomorrow. Um, but in our uh, checklist for landing the aircraft, you'll notice that the turning the battery off is one of the last things we do because we want to have avail availability for using the flaps. In other aircraft that have mechanically operated flaps, um, then you usually turn the battery off pretty early. There's no reason to have that electrical system as part of the equation. We'll talk about why in just a second. 
Uh, you want to keep your altitude, then plan to use a forward slip to control the touchdown location. So that forward slip that we talked about a couple of lessons ago, it's a good way to lose altitude. Don't want to try and stretch the glide. Let me reiterate that. Before you land, you're essentially doing two things. You're securing the fuel system and you're securing the electrical system. So if you notice on this checklist, it has um, if no restart and time permits. So this is if there's enough time before you go and land. And it says that you want to pull your mixture to idle cutoff, your fuel shutoff valve off, uh, and then your flaps is needed because, again, these are electrical, and then you turn your master and mags off. The reason that we turn off our fuel and electrical system is we don't want to have more fuel flowing through the system um, than we need. So we want to have all of the ways that fuel would spread all cut um, in case of like a fire, for instance. Um, and electrical is the same sort of thing. We don't want to have electricity running through the wires at touchdown in case, uh, because that's then an increased risk of a fire. Um, so again, as we come in for uh, the last part of our landing, we're securing the electrical system, securing the fuel system. We can do that by following the checklist. Um, we should do that by following the checklist, but that's the, the theory behind it is you want to get the fuel system shut off and the electrical system shut off. You want to unlatch your doors before touchdown. Um, you at touchdown, if the frame of the cabin gets bent and the doors are not open, it can be the case that the doors get bent in such a way that they're forced, uh, stuck, closed. And so you want to have those doors unlatched before you touch down so that at touchdown, the doors are open uh, for you to actually get out of the aircraft. And you, the last thing here, maintain aircraft control all the way through the landing. Um, so a controlled landing in bad terrain is better than an uncontrolled landing in good terrain. This goes back to that av aviate, navigate, communicate idea. Um, you really want to fly the airplane all the way through the controlled collision. A couple considerations for a safe landing. Uh, you want to protect the cabin. So you want to keep the aircraft cabin intact, for instance, by getting rid of dispensable structures. So like if you're going to shear off the wings, uh, but you keep the cabin intact, that's one way to do it. Uh, you can use the landing gear, another thing that could be sheared off just fine. But you want to protect that cabin because that's where the passengers are. Which leads to number two, you want to protect the passengers. Um, a big thing to do is make sure seatbelts are on and secure. Um, at touchdown, if there's a rapid deceleration, uh, passengers flying forward, um, that's where you can hit your head or you can get damaged, uh, uh, just like in a car accident, right? So you wanna have those seatbelts on. Um, some checklists will say to put like a uh, sweater or something in front of your head or on the console so that if uh, heads do go forward, then there's something soft to, to hit. The last thing to consider is you want to remove energy slowly on landing however you can. So you're looking for ways to absorb that energy over time, and you want to have a slow ground speed as you come in. So the most dangerous thing that can happen is if you have a lot of energy when you come in, and then you remove all that energy instantaneously. So that would be like you know a car running into a wall at 60 miles per hour is a really bad scenario. Much better would be if you land in like a field of corn that's going to slowly decelerate the airplane over a longer distance. So you have to dissipate the same amount of energy, but you can spread it out. And in spreading it out, then you make the collision, um, the peak uh, deceleration, the collision much less. So you're trying to minimize that peak deceleration in a controlled class cr uh, crash. A couple notes on the best train selection. Um, one thought is roads are really tempting, uh, especially at night because you can see them, but you want to be careful because roads will often have electrical wires or other hazards that are hard to see until you're right up close. Um, plus there's traffic on the road, so landing in a road may not actually be your best option. There are a bunch of other suggestions from the FAA in the AFH Chapter 18. Good things to read through, things like what about landing in brush, what about landing in tall trees, what about landing in uh, kind of different trains. Um, so I won't talk much more about that right now, but if you want to look through these, these are really good and I, I highly recommend checking them out. A couple considerations for ditching. If you are ditching in the ocean and there's high winds with heavy seas, so that means we have um, strong wind, but maybe not as big a waves, then you want to land into the wind. Same sort of thing as on the ground, you're reducing your ground speed. And so that means that when you're landing in the water, you're going to be touching down at a slower speed. On the flip side, if you have light winds but heavy swells, so if there's big kind of rolling waves, you want to land parallel to the swells. So if you try to land into the wind, you may be landing across.
across the crests of the waves. Um, and that sort of thing is where you could maybe catch your landing gear and flip the plane into a wave. Um, so it'd be much better to land between the swells where you then can do a uh, full touchdown and landing and then have the plane upright uh, in the water for, for everyone to get out. A couple psychological hazards just to be aware of. Um, one is not accepting the situation. So if you're kind of going like, oh, this isn't happening to me, um, that wasted altitude uh, is something you'll never get back. So you want to have started A, B, C, D, E immediately upon recognizing the aircraft's um, engine is gone. Um, and then the other hazard is a desire to save the airplane. So something to keep in mind is if the engine quits, it's the insurance company's problem now. Um, so your job as pilot in command is to um, make the safest uh, landing you can. You want it to be a survivable landing. And if you need to sacrifice the aircraft to save um, or for the safety of the passengers, that might be the best thing to do. Um, obviously, if there's like a runway nearby and you can just land on the runway, that's best case scenario. Um, but your priority is the passengers and the safety of people on the ground, not the airplane. All right, let's dive into what we're going to do for practicing then today. So we're going to practice the emergency procedures in flight. So we'll go up to altitude and actually do the A, B, C, D, E of the procedures. Um, and we can go through and do this all the way down. Because we're in the sim, one of the nice advantages is you can actually practice your emergency landings all the way through to a field. Um, the terrain in the sim is not always representative of the terrain in the real world, so just something to keep in mind, but, uh, but we can actually practice the full procedure. Um, it will be, well, I'll talk about this when I get up to the, the flight. The other thing we'll do today is we'll actually try flying to land from a key excuse me, a key point. And we do this in the real world of practice uh, at the airport. So we'll ask for a power off approach um, from the tower. And if they can for spacing with other aircraft, they'll let us then we'll cut our engine uh, by pulling throttle back to idle at the key point in the pattern. And then we will glide all the way around to land on the, on the airport uh, runway. This is something for your commercial license that you're required to demonstrate landing within a specific zone. Um, but it's also something as a private pilot that's really good to just be practicing and get the ability to land without an engine uh, down pat. It's something that you can practice in the pattern. It's something you should practice in the pattern. Um, so yeah, so we'll do two things. One is practice the emergency procedures in flight. Then we'll come back to the airport. We'll practice uh, landing uh, from the key point and the pattern. Um, that'll be the rest of the lesson here today. Couple common errors, you gotta aviate first. Don't let distractions lead to loss of control. So especially if it's a low altitude, like you lose your engine uh, right after takeoff, number one priority is to aviate. Fly the airplane to a landing. The route of flight with fewer or no landing options. If you read through this chapter 18, they'll talk about landing options. And I think in a really healthy way, essentially saying that if you're flying over inhospitable terrain and you don't have any landing options in your flight plan, and then something goes wrong, you aren't gonna have any good options because you didn't give yourself any good outs. Um, so when you're planning a, a long cross country, you wanna be thinking about, okay, if I lost my engine in this train, what am I gonna do for my emergency landing? Um, and you wanna have predetermined that there are at least some options for where you could go. Lack of situational awareness, you wanna be aware of positions and options as you're flying. You wanna have those options in mind before an emergency happens. And then failure to use a checklist. So you will use the flow to make sure that we do everything quickly, but then we want to check it over with the checklist. One thing that um, an instructor that I really like, um, uh, the guy who does the finer points, if you are interested in any aviation content, um, talks about with students is that he is allowed to ask the student at any point, which emergency field are you going to go to right now? And they, in turn, are also allowed to ask him at any point which emergency field are you going to go to right now. Um, I actually will do this with folks when I fly around the Bay Area if they are comfortable with talking about that. Some people kind of want to be like, oh, I'm going to pretend like emergencies don't happen. And that's totally understandable and, and just fine. Um, but some folks are like, I really want to know what your thought process is. So where, where would you go right now if you lost an engine? Um, and then I can talk about you know, what option I already had in my head, but then also the other considerations that went into choosing that. Um, so something about doing with your own instructor if you're working on these. OK, let's go and do our ABCDEs. 
So I'm going to hop over to VR here. Get myself set up. If there are any questions today, which is totally fine. Um, I sort of expected more, to be honest, just because it's um, kind of a dense topic. But there's a lot of good information online. And so if you are uh, wanting to read more, there's a lot of, uh, of good input and articles have been written about, um, about this topic. Good. Oops, actually, I didn't want to do that just yet. Loading up. Uh, we're going to start in flight. Actually, I can just switch over to. Move this like that. Yeah, that'll work. Okay, so. We're going to start in flight here, and we can start. Um, We'll just start over. Stanford is okay. Um, we have our live weather on, which is fine. Um, let's do clear sky so that we know that we have no wind. Um, if we're doing live weather, then I'd want to make sure that we get the ATIS. We know what the current winds aloft are. Um, so clear skies is just sort of so that uh, wind isn't part of our consideration for this first practice. Um, we can land any direction we want in those calm winds. Um, but then we can increase the winds and, and play a little bit with that too. Uh, looking at the time, we'll see. We'll see if we have time for that. So, okay, make sure I got my airplane set up to fly. Another thing I'll mention for practicing this, um, and I think I have this in the uh, required homework, but I found it really valuable in my own flying club to check out a plane and just sit on the ground in the actual flight deck, uh, you know, where I sit as the pilot, and go through these maneuvers. Um, some people are just fine at just visualizing what they would do or where things uh, would be in the actual aircraft. Um, but for me, it was really nice to, to actually have the flight deck in front of me and actually touch through all these on the flow. Uh, I did that for all of my emergency man uh, maneuvers for any new aircraft I, I get checked out in. I always go and sit and say, okay, I'm going to run through every single, every single emergency. I want to know what I would do and touch. And then also for the ones I'm going to memorize, the couple of key ones where you really don't have time to go look it up, um, like an emergency landing. Um, then, then I'll go and spend uh, a bit more on, on getting that all set up. Uh, okay, let's do this. Pull up here. So I'm just getting a set up. We're going to 3,500 here. Um, you can see already my glide ring is expanding. So there's the distance that ForeFlight is saying that I'd be able to glide. Um, and so even just a little bit higher than this, we would, according to ForeFlight, at least be able to glide to Palo Alto. So something to consider. Uh, it also takes into account the terrain, so you'll notice that as we get to the mountains, it has this sort of like jagged line. Um, so, just a neat, a neat tool to have uh, in your lap. Okay, I think that's probably good. And just a second, I'm going to get up uh, set up for VR. Okay. All right, looking good. All right, so get my position set here. It's good. So I'm going to unpause here. Um, Looking at our airspace, we should probably come off to the right. So let's see if that works. Get my autopilot on. Disable that. I want to stay at 3,500. Looking for traffic where we're turning. Now, before we do any maneuver, we want to be doing uh, our clearing turns. So we can do our first 90 degrees here. We're turning back around. 
Now you know how to read the GPS there, so you can see we're right on the edge of the class Bravo or Delta airspace for Palo Alto, but the airspace doesn't go up to 3,500. So we're okay here. We're flying over it, but um, not a concern. All right, there's our first 90 degree turn. I'm gonna turn back another 90. traffic around. Okay, and also I'm looking now, so I'm uh, always trying to identify what my emergency landing field would be, so I want to have something in mind already. Um, I know this practice area because I use it uh, in the real world, and so I kind of know already where I'd like to go, which is the equestrian field over there. It's actually pretty open and, um, and a, a pretty reasonable option for emergency landing. Um, okay, so there's our two 90 degree turns. Um, so let's do a simulated engine out. So the way that we do this is we pull back power. First thing, airspeed 68. So we start to pitch for best airspeed, trimming up power, turning to our field, which is already over here. So there's our B. We already sort of headed towards our field. Now we start doing our flow. So um, I'm gonna pause here um, and run through what this flow looks like. So it's this L shape across the flight deck. So both fuel valve in, uh, mixture rich, our fuel pump on, uh, master on, and then our magnetos. And we're gonna check both sides of the magnetos. So we're gonna go uh, click, click to left, see if it fixes it, click, click back, click to right, see if it fixes it, and then back to both. I'm sorry, right and then left. Um, so when I practice this, when I chair flight, I go click, 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 click. And essentially what we're doing is we're trying to see if maybe there's something wrong with the magneto electrical system that removing one of the magnetos would just fix. So this is our quick debugging flow through the aircraft. So again, fuel selector bolt, uh, fuel shutoff valve on, mixture rich, fuel pump on, uh, master on, magnetos both, uh, I'm sorry, magnetos click, 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 click. Okay, and the next thing we do is run our finger over the checklist. So again, you'd have your paper checklist in your lap, um, but we'll do it just on this one. Uh, best glide, wind direction, pick landing site, fuel shutoff valve on, fuel selector, check uh, both, um, fuel auxiliary pump on. Oh, you can also, on the fuel selector valve, you can uh, make sure it's on both, but you could also try both sides of it if you have a little more time to debug. Um, mixture full rich, magnetos, check all. That's the click, 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 click. Um, and then master on. Okay, so we hit everything on that checklist. Um, in confirming on the checklist, we also give the airplane a second to respond to the changes. So if, for instance, it was something in the fuel system, maybe it needs a moment for the fuel to get flowing again. Um, but at that point, we would know, at this point, we know that it's not coming back to life. So we've done our ABC, uh, ABC. now it's D, declare the emergency, so let's continue flying this. So one thing is I want to continue holding my best glide, and I'm trimming it up so that I don't have to keep flying the airplane. And now I'm at 65, I want to be at 68. There's my best field, it's still there. Um, declare the emergency. So I go 7700. I won't actually bug that in, but 7700. We'd say uh, get on the radio. We already would have Palo Alto Tower bugged in, but if we didn't, we could go to 121.5. We'd say, um, oh, usually there's a emergency button here. Oh, that's okay. But we go 121.5, 1 1, so let's bug that in. 121.5. Making sure we're holding our best glide. So we're going a little slow, but our trim is more or less correct. And we're going to say, uh, okay, and then we go, Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, 2,900 uh, engine failure, emergency landing, uh, you know, near slack. Uh, Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, um, uh, engine failure, emergency landing, uh, 2,700 near slack. And then I probably turn the radio off at this point. Um, so, okay. Now we have done our declare. Now we're on execute. The first things are survivor statement. I'm a glider pilot. I'm going to land this airplane. Still holding our best glide. We want to get to our key point here. And we know that there's no, um, no, uh, wind to worry about. So in this case, we don't have to do anything to get into the wind. I do want to make sure I'm still maintaining my best glide though. There's my landing field. Uh, on the iPad, it'll actually tell me what my um, AGL is if I have this set up correctly, which I should before that. So height AGL 1,700. So got about 700 feet still to work with. 
Um, I really like where I am. I like that I'm about you know halfway up my strut for landing on the other side of that field. Still holding 68 just fine. What you can't see is that I've trimmed the airplane to be at 68. Um, so I have about 500 feet still to go. I'm gonna, um, this is my key point where I am right now. And so I got there a little early. Um, so I'm gonna just turn off uh, in kind of a, a circle here, uh, just a bit of a spiral to get to my key point. Um, and it looks like my key point is gonna be at um, about 300 feet below here. So about 1,400 or so. You can also just eyeball it, kind of estimate where it is. I want to keep holding my best glide, 68. Okay, now I'm running through my checklist for securing the aircraft. So fuel and electrical systems. So uh, mixture uh, out, uh, fuel shutoff valve off. I need to leave my master on because I have, so now I'm actually gliding this plane. Um, I need to leave my fuel select, or my master on because I want to have my um, flaps available, but I'm going to turn my magnetos to off. So holding 68, I'm a little bit low on my uh, key point. I wanted to be at my key point at 1,300 and it's 1,200. I'm also a little slow on my best glide, so I'm gonna aim, aim my nose down. Because I'm a little low coming into my key point, I will use a little bit shorter downwind and turn a little bit earlier, uh, but that's all right. So now we run our finger over the checklist, make sure that there's nothing else we need to do. Again, paper copy the checklist is really good. Um, Squawk 77, declare emergency mixture, idle, fuel shut off, seatbelts on. Um, flaps is needed, master mag. We're going to unlock the door. So looking at my field here, still holding 68 as I turn back around here. Uh, Seatbelts are on, unlatch the door. I haven't put in flaps because I'm coming in a little lower than I want. And I want to hold that best glide. This is exactly where it gets tempting to stretch the glide. But your best glide is still going to get you to the best possible place. Okay, oops. Okay, and okay, well, flying through the trees a little bit here, but then, yeah, okay, that's really discouraging. <laughs> Sorry about that. This is also why you don't talk through in slow motion all of those things, I suppose. So um, anyway, okay, let's do that one again. Um, and uh, and this time I will say A, B, C, D, E, but, but actually focus on doing the landing instead of um, like switching between VR and iPad and everything, so. Okay, so we're at 1,500. I wanna climb up a little bit more here because um, I wouldn't be flying this low anyway. Oops. Give myself a little more altitude. Okay, 3,400, that's all right. Um, so let's go uh, engine failure, so uh, fuel idle, so ABC, best first thing to do, airspeed 68, best field. I like the field I had over there, um, and I think I can glide to it, although honestly we're now within distance of the Palo Alto Airport, um, which is going to be a much better airfield anyway. Um, why don't we use that one since it's a good example? So I want to make sure my airspeed is 68, so I'm getting a little slow here. Uh, checklist, so I do my flow. Full fuel shutoff valve in, mixture rich, uh, fuel pump on. Oops, oh my autopilot's on. Bug this sim, okay. I was like, why is it forcing me to do all this weird stuff? Okay, um, and then magnetos click, 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 and then um, making sure we're maintaining best glide. Sorry for the erratic glide. I didn't realize that the autopilot was on and so it was readjusting my trim for me. So now my best field is the Palo Alto Airport. So I'm heading over that direction. Again, trying to set up for a good landing here. I want to hold 68. Uh, at this point, then we grab a checklist, run our finger over the checklist, make sure we didn't miss anything. And then uh, declare 7700 uh, squawk. We'd say mayday, mayday, mayday. Cessna Alpha Lima Tango and Jasera, 2300. Uh, total engine failure landing Palo Alto. And then probably turn off the uh, radio. Um, we know the traffic pattern altitude of Palo Alto, and so we're trying to get to our key point now. So we're on the E, the execute. So uh, I'm a glider pilot. I'm going to land this aircraft. And now we're getting to our key point, uh, 1,000 feet above, um, and a beam that, that runway, still holding 68. 
Now we start to run through the checklist for securing uh, fuel and engine. So we're gonna do our shutoff valve uh, off, uh, mixture idle, fuel pump uh, off. We leave our magnetos on, or sorry, our master on because we wanna have access to our flaps. Um, and uh, then we run our finger over the checklist. Uh, so I would catch something if I missed it, but um, I'm not gonna leave VR because that's not what happened last time I was switching back and forth from the iPad. Uh, plus the main priority is to aviate, right? So, okay, now we're getting to our key position. Got a little bit of altitude, a little bit more probably than I need, and I'm gonna use 10 degrees of flaps as soon as I get to that key point anyway. Um, when we do our power off 180 practice at the airport, we can talk about the procedure there, but typically I advise to do flaps to 10 as soon as you get to your key point. So we're a little high on our key point, so I'm gonna bring my flaps to 10 now. Seatbelts on, and we'd also do unlatch our door just before touchdown, so we leave it there. Uh, we have flaps 10, we wanna use our best glide of uh, 60. Um, so start to slow our glide downs a little bit different. We're looking out our window, there's our landing point, uh, and we're trying to judge then our descent rate for it. So we're a thousand feet above, we're looking pretty good. Okay, and about four seconds after we cross our point is usually when I start to turn in. And we have our uh, flaps that we can bring in to increase our descent angle. Um, and also we can always forward slip. So again, it's better to come in a little high um, than not. And I'm using my trim to make sure I'm maintaining airspeed. Uh, okay, judging my distance here. I'm gonna continue gliding where I am because I'd rather come in a little bit high and then shed off that altitude. And I can show you what that looks like too. Okay, and I'm trying to see what my aiming point is. So what is the actual point that the airplane is currently gliding to? Okay, so we're going a little bit fast here. I wanna come in and cross at about 60 knots as our minimum airspeed. So I brought 20, 20 degrees of flaps in. Good, and then we can go full flaps here. Once the flaps come down, we can turn off our electrical system and we can do a forward slip here to bleed off that extra altitude. We wanna maintain 60 knots, so we don't wanna get slow, a little slow. And then as we come into land, then we fly it just like a normal landing, uh, level off above the ground and land the aircraft. Okay, great. So that would be sort of what you're looking for. Of course, in a real uh, landing, we wouldn't turn the mixture, like we wouldn't pull the mixture out. Um, you just bring the throttle back to simulate the engine failure because uh, you want to be able to, for instance, go around if you need to. But uh, yeah, okay, so that, that I would say was a pretty good example of um, a reasonable uh, engine failure. Something to note about the difference between my first one where I was uh, came in short and that one, um, I was very distracted with switching between VR and my iPad and I wasn't paying attention to my airspeed nor my altitude. Um, and so I was at my key point low. Uh, oh, that's kind of interesting. Um, so I was at my key point low and then coming into the key point low, then I didn't have the uh, altitude to make it to the field, didn't realize in time to turn in sooner. And so I would say that's a great example of aviate, navigate, communicate. Um, I was prioritizing the third one, communicating, trying to say what I was doing, um, and then lost my focus on actually flying the aircraft. So the second one then, I didn't do those things, uh, prioritized instead aviating and was, uh, just fine for landing. A couple things you noticed me do as we were coming into the airport. One is that I was using the flaps as I knew that I was going to make the field, then I was increasing my flaps. Um, and the other thing that I was doing was I was, uh, I used a forward slip at the end to lose altitude. Um, I didn't like that my airspeed got low um, towards the end, so I was coming in at like 55 or so. We really want to come in at 60, our, our short field landing speed. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, okay. We see, so we did a little bit there then of the practicing um, the ABCDEs. Um, we can practice just that execute part, which is you know one of the key muscles um, by requesting from the tower a short field approach. So why don't we do one round of that real quick? Um, how are we doing for time? Um, 
So, can I do this? I'm gonna see if I can restart this airplane real quick. Do this the uh, the control E way. Great. So let's taxi back to the beginning of the airport. Hold on. break on <laughs> all right that's funny all right so we'll taxi back here so we're gonna do a lap in the pattern we'll do kind of what it would look like to practice a power off 180 um, in the pattern So if there's no one else around here, Tower might clear us. At this point, they might say something like Cessna Alpha Lima, Tango India Sierra, uh, clear for takeoff runway 31, right close traffic. They might say clear for takeoff runway 31, right close traffic. We could ask at this point for a short approach. We can also ask on the upwind. Um, depending on how busy it is, you may want them to be aware of your request earlier. Uh, also, if it's super busy, they probably won't be able to accommodate, but it just depends on the tower and the day. Uh, but we might say something like uh, request short approach, and then the tower might say uh, uh, short approach approved or short, uh, probably if we're still on the ground, they probably say something like short approach on request, um, essentially meaning like, okay, when we get to the point of approving you to land, then we'll approve you for a short approach. Okay, coming up here. So they'd say Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra. Uh, let's get back to the, you can press and hold clear to go back to the uh, map. Um, uh, okay, and it'll turn this off. Okay, so I say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango is here, clear for takeoff runway 31. And so I have 31 bugged up here. Precise, okay. Um, when we sit, we always have a thousand. So lights, camera, action. So our lights are on. Camera is good. One, two, zero, zero. Action. Our trim is set. Mixture rich. Flaps 10. Okay, great. So we're going. Clear the traffic pattern. Make sure there's no one coming in. No wind today, so no wind correction needed on the ailerons. Located threshold. All right, and then as we get to the threshold, we can bring in power over the course of four seconds. So we'll go one, two, three, four. Maintain rudder uh, center line with right rudder. Kind of dancing on the pedals. Air speed's alive. Good. There's forty. And rotate at fifty-five. And now we pitch for VY and climb out. Steep on that airspeed. Right. So I'm looking for 74. At 200 feet, we bring our flaps to 10. Or I'm sorry, flaps, uh, remove our flaps. We also deviate a little bit to the right for noise abatement. Um, oh, my heading indicator is way off. 
Um, you really need to set this in level flight. Um, so I'm just going to do this for raw. Okay. Two hundred feet below traffic pattern altitude, we could start turning crosswind. Um, of course, traffic pattern altitude is eight hundred here, so we could start at like five hundred if we really wanted to. Looking for traffic, we're turning fifty feet before eight hundred. Bring our power to two thousand. Do our pattern eight hundred. Looking for traffic coming down here. Um, I think it was flying turd mentioned that you can cross reference your angle on the attitude indicator. Make sure you're flying ninety degrees to the runway. It's a good suggestion there. So. 200 or 2000 RPM, turning downwind. And I'm giving myself a little bit of a wider base here um, so I have more time to figure out how I want to get around the uh, pattern for an engine out. At this point, we might say something, or maybe on the up one, we might say something like request short approach. Tower would probably say something like Cessna Alpha Lima Tango India Sierra, cleared for, uh, cleared for the option runway 31, short approach approved. And so that would mean that we're allowed to do an engine out um, sort of approach in. We practice these all from the key point. Um, on this side of the traffic pattern, we use 800 feet, um, which is sort of a bummer because in the uh, real emergency, we'd use 1,000. So it's good to get some practice in at 1,000. You could do that either on the other side, traffic pattern, or at another airport. Um, all right, looking at my window. Expected to be about halfway up my strut. Looks pretty good. Gumps check, gas undercarriage uh, mixture. Pump and switch, okay. A beam our touchdown point, power to idle, flaps 10 immediately. And we're looking for 85 at this point. Um, and I know that seems like steep. Normally we pitch for, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. I'm uh, sorry, we wanna go 65 at that point. So let the uh, flaps for 10 glide for 65. And then after about four seconds, I start turning on to base. I'm doing the same thing I did last time, which is I'm communicating instead of aviating. So I'm gonna start flying as top priority. So I really wanna hold 65, trim that out, make sure I'm not holding it back on the elevator. We're getting pretty low pretty quickly here. So I'm gonna turn directly to the numbers. We fly right to the airport. Looking at my aiming point, seeing where we're going. But now at this point, I'm thinking about, okay, if I can't make it to that aiming point, because it looks like I'm going to be a little short of the runway, um, do I want to turn to the right and maybe land on this field next door? Um, I think we can make it an okay landing here, though. So obviously in the real world, we would go around, uh, bring in our flaps and flaps. Yeah, I don't like this. This is a really bad idea. I was doing something that I felt comfortable doing in the sim because it's the sim, but that's not um, that's not the right philosophy. So, all right, so go around flaps 20, accelerate to VY at full power. So we reach the other end of the runway, then we Deviate 10 degrees off. See our electrical wires there. 200 feet, flaps to 10. I'm sorry, flaps to zero. We should have had flaps to 10 already as soon as we got to VY at a positive rate of climb. Uh, one of the other things I'm realizing is that the behavior in the sim and the behavior in the plane may be different enough that some of the standard ways that I would time things out to land, so doing a crosswind here, um, may not work in the sim uh, just by the nature of how the sim uh, does things like best glide and all that sort of stuff. So, um, so I'm kind of beating myself up a little bit because I'm like, oh, I should, you know, I should be able to stick this every time. But I think the reality is I've practiced this hundreds of times in a real airplane, but I've only practiced it in the sim uh, you know, five times or something like that. And really more thinking about the procedures because the actual behavior doesn't really translate the same way anyway. All right, so we're on our downwind. We are gumps check, gas is on both, and we're gonna have to tank, undercarriage, welded, mixture, rich. 
uh, prop fixed, switches look fine, seat belts, okay. Getting set up for our wide base. So what I'm gonna do differently this time, um, learning from the last time we went around is in a real airplane, I, tip, I will bring in 10 degrees of flaps uh, and start to pitch down to essentially fly a normal pattern. I'm not gonna bring in any flaps this time and instead I'm going to um, try and assess what my actual glide is in this aircraft. So power to idle is where I beam the touchdown point, getting to my best glide of 68. And we're trying to fly a nice, good pattern here. So you might want to turn in. Sometimes people will say like a stop sign pattern. So you kind of fly at these like uh, you know, 45 degree angles. So you can kind of see what your descent is as you're going. Um, and in fact, I'm going to start turning back to the runway right now. Because even at our 68 best glide, it still feels like I'm dropping more than I am used to dropping in this aircraft. So I've got the best glide trimmed in so that I'm not tempted to pull back on the yoke. If you're pulling back on the yoke, that's where you could accidentally stall. Now I'm trying to get myself set up for a turn from base to final. It's nice to have a clean turn to final if you can. Um, we're looking okay on altitude, not great, but okay. And I would like to be flying a little bit slower. So I'm gonna drop in my flaps now that I feel like I have the runway made. There's my first degree of flaps, second notch of flaps. And third knots of flaps. Now that adds a lot of drag to my aircraft. Flying in at 60. I can use my side slip to can lose some more uh, altitude, steepen my descent. And then we round out for uh, landing. Hold that landing attitude and let the airplane come down. Okay. Not the cleanest landing, but acceptable. So. All right, let's slew back out to the airfield. We'll do, how are we on time? We're doing all right, so we'll do one more from the, the sky. I'll try and do an emergency landing into uh, a field out there instead of to an airport, although obviously an airport's great if you have one in, in landing distance, so you know, don't hesitate to use that. Um, and I will say through the ABCs as I'm doing them, but um, really focus on aviating. Uh, Okay, get my slew going here. Let's go somewhere a little new. Three thousand five hundred is fine. So again, we would start with our clearing turns. Let's see what's going on here. So our clearing turns ID and emergency field. Um, these ones here seem like they'd be pretty good. Uh, typically in California, our wind is coming from the northwest. Obviously, check and understand the winds for the day. But we can say that the wind is coming from the northwest for what we're doing now. Um, and I like these emergency fields here, so we can use that as our, our emergency one. So we'll say that we've done our uh, clearing turns, so 90 degrees to the right, 90 degrees to the left, and then engine out. So A, B, C, first thing we do is turn to our best field. We'll use the ones down there, those look good. And our best glide is 68. I'm already essentially holding altitude until I get to 68, and then trimming so that I don't have to hold back pressure at that altitude. Okay, there's 68. Checklist, our flow, so we go both fuel, uh, fuel selector off, mixture rich, uh, fuel pump on, which I will actually turn on, oops, watching my airspeed. And magnetos, click, 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 click. Try those all out, okay. Um, so not restarting, and then we run our finger over the checklist, pull out our paper checklist, make sure that we haven't missed anything. Uh, at this point, now we're on to declare 7700 on the uh, Transponder, Mayday, 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 probably 121.5, Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango, India Sierra, uh, 10 miles south of Half Moon Bay at 2,800, uh, engine failure, uh, emergency landing, Mayday, 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 Cessna Alpha Lima Tango, India Sierra, 
2,800, five, uh, seven miles south of Half Moon Bay, uh, engine failure, emergency landing, uh, and then probably turn the radio off. All right, execute. So looking for our best field. The one I was originally planning to use is over there. As I'm getting closer, it looks like the train is a little bit um, rocky looking, and I actually really like this one that I'm seeing right there. Um, I have about, so these are just above sea level, um, so I have about a thousand feet to get over there. So I'm looking okay. So I'm going to actually use this field right here as my landing field. Uh, okay, so survival statement. I'm a glider pilot. I'm going to land this airplane. And now we start our securing flows. So we're going to turn off our fuel uh, and uh, electrical system. Again, we leave our master on because we want to have a supply mixture out, pull our fuel selector valve off. Um, and then uh, leaving our master on, so we have access to our flaps. There's our field, keeping our field in mind. Still holding 68. I've had this trimmed out for a while, so I've actually needed very, very light touches on the um, on the controls. It, it really just flies itself, which is exactly the, the idea. And I want to get set up for a nice uh, key point. So I have 900 feet to go to my key point, and so I'm watching that as I go. Uh, we could also do uh, ditching into the ocean here. The shores are not very forgiving. Uh, lots of rocks and things like that, so I wouldn't necessarily advise that, especially with these nice uh, nice fields here. 700 feet to my key point. Gliding in right about where I want. Run my finger over the checklist for the um, emergency landing. Make sure I don't forget anything. Things like seat belts. Uh, we'll unlatch the door before we touch down. Okay. I'm a little high in my key point, but I'm okay and I'd rather be a little bit high. I can extend my base a bit. So uh, at this point, I'm still holding 68, my best glide. And now I'm doing the exact same thing I did the pattern. So two, four. I'm gonna start turning in here on sort of a octagon, uh, uh, like a stop sign shape, like an octagon um, to get to that landing point. I'm landing just beyond that lake there into that field. Um, well, there's actually several options. Uh, that seemed like they would work okay. Okay, feeling a little high, so I'm going to bring in 10 degrees of flaps. And holding for 65. Turning on to final here for this landing. And 20 degrees of flaps. And now we're actually got quite a bit to slip out, so I'm going to switch into a forward slip. Holding 60 knots. We have too much to go and I don't like that field. So I'm actually gonna bring, hold 60, bring flaps back. We're gonna change to this field uh, beyond those trees. And the reason that I feel comfortable doing that is I can see the point that I'm gliding to in my windshield and see that I have enough of a glide to actually get to where I want it to be, so. Okay, now that we're clearing these trees, good. Bringing my flaps down, transitioning to a side slip, uh, master off, and side slip all the way to the ground. Coming in a little low, we wanna fly the airplane to the ground and hold off landing. So now I'm seeing that we're coming towards this tree. This would be one where shearing the, yeah, okay. So what I would have done in that case is use the tree um, I would have tried to go around uh, on the uh, left side of the tree because hitting it there would spin the airplane around um, pretty fast. Now we were going relatively slow at that point, which is great, but still, still would have been a lot of whiplash for passengers. Um, if there were two trees that were evenly spaced, you could hit them at the same time to shear the wings off. That would be another thing you could potentially do. So of course the aircraft damage is, I don't know what causes the sim to quit out, but um, okay. So I will say having done this as a lesson in the real world is a little less um, traumatizing than in the sim because in the sim we land and then we hit a tree and then the sim changes. So um, or the sim like quits out. So in some ways it's nice to practice in the sim, I guess, because you can kind of fully execute the landing. Um, in other ways, it's a, a little bit more traumatic. In the real world, we would go around before we get below our minimum altitudes. Um, so, yeah. 
Uh, okay, well, I think that's it. Let me flip back to the lesson plan here. Um, I haven't gotten any questions today, which is totally fine, but um, I sort of thought there would be more for emergency landings. Uh, but let's talk about the completion standards. So clients should develop knowledge of emergency situations procedures and demonstrate ability to maneuver and land the aircraft or the airplane while following checklist procedures, including emergency communications. Required homework, you want to memorize that engine out restart flow. This should be something you can just do, you know, bam, 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 um, around the whole flight deck. Um, one thing that you might want to do is get a picture of the Cessna 172 flight deck, and then you can go fly through it. Uh, and then also read the POH chapter three, that's the emergency procedures. It covers what we talked about today, but also then it'll cover the emergency procedures we talk about tomorrow. Recommended homework, you wanna chair fly the emergency landing. So practice the A, B, C, D, E's, uh, make sure that you have those down uh, cleanly and so that you don't have to think about it while you're out actually flying. All right, if there are no other questions, then we will call it there today. So thanks everyone for joining and uh, see you tomorrow for, I'm sorry, uh, I won't see you tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow I am in an interview, but uh, on Friday I will see you for emergency operations. So have a good rest of your Wednesday.